Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kin's independent media production. Today, we are doing another installment of matching, character-wise, reference tracks. This isn't about making the exact same sound from a record because there's too many variables there. It's really, in my opinion, not worth stressing out about too much. And especially if you're thinking in terms of situations you're going to be playing in, making records, things like that. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's episode. If you're unfamiliar, they are a learning platform online with thousands of classes, thousands of members, an amazing array of subjects. There's something on there for absolutely everybody. We are also super excited to be giving away free trials of Skillshare's premium membership to the first thousand people that follow the link below and run over there to check out what they have to offer. And after the completion of your trial period, it's less than $10 a month for an annual membership and you can continue learning for as long as you want. Their platform has subjects as wide ranging as you could possibly imagine. Like I said, there's really something for everybody over there. Personally, right now, I'm super excited about the fundamentals of DSLR photography with Justin Bridges. I just bought a camera. As you can see, I'm pretty much the person always in front of the camera here. I don't know anything about digital photography at all, but it's one of the things I've become interested in. I want to know more about it, and this is the perfect place for me to learn how to get started. In addition to art and photography and music, there's also cooking and interior design. It runs the absolute gamut, and we really encourage you to follow the link below. Check it out find something that appeals to you. I I, I can't say enough about it. We like to pick a couple of sort of disparate things when we do stuff like this here so that we're not kind of going down one straight path. So we decided to go with a couple of sounds that are fairly kind of ambient, fairly kind of era specific, but also live in sort of completely different places, you know, on the on the radio dial. We're referencing two specific songs today, or more importantly, kind of two specific eras of these bands. The first one is going to be the classic Rosanna by Toto. There's a lot of mythology around this tune, a lot of mythology around Porcaro and his playing and his sounds and everything. But first of all, let's listen to how these drums are sounding today. If you're unfamiliar with this track, take a moment, jump over to whatever service or device you use to listen to music and check it out because it starts with drums alone. So it's a really great opportunity to be able to hear them without anything else cluttering the sound of the kit. Now we dug deep, we found out exactly what drums they used that day, exactly what mics they used that day. Like I said at the beginning, that's not what we're after here. We don't have a vintage Radio King snare drum here. We don't have the room that they were in. But if you're making your own music or playing with other people and you think to yourself, ah, it's a great sound, I want to get something like that, that's what we're going to address right now. For this sound, we're going to be using the sort of standard house pearl maple 22-inch bass drum. I brought over my 8-lug stave shell cherry blackwood snare here, which kind of gets into that fatness and also has some crack to it. And lastly, we're using some 15-inch kind of medium-weight Zildjian prototype fat hats. Here's the sound we ended up with, and afterwards we'll talk about what we did to achieve this. All right, now as you can hear, aside from the fact that this is a super hard beat to play, (laughs) this is a full production sound. There is EQ, compression, reverb, all the sorts of things that you would expect to hear on a completed drum track. Now, if you watched an earlier episode that we just made recently about comparing recorded sounds to acoustic sounds and making sure that we don't get too hung up on that, what we're doing here is more of a comparison between their recorded sound and our recorded sound. We're not exactly trying to make what they made, we're trying to go after the character of that sound. Some of the things to include about this is that this is a shallow drum, which I chose because I like to tune down shallow drums sometimes for a fatter sound because you still get good articulation for ghost notes because of the shorter distance between the heads. Pretty dead bass drum. We got a sandbag in there, super duper punchy. We have these more kind of like articulate hi-hats to match that kind of sound. It's not the same snare drum. It's definitely not the same hi-hats, not the same kick, but learning from recordings like this that are sort of seminal and classic can help us to just think about sound in these ways when we have a sound in our head that we want to go get. (laughs) 
Additionally, for this scenario, in listening to the sound of the old recording, I wanted to make sure that I didn't choke out the drum because there is some warmth in it, but at the same time, the bigness of the snare sound is relying on the room and the reverb a fair amount, so we are going for a relatively high tension, but not tight. It's got enough bounce that the ghost notes feel good, but it's also got a soft kind of feel to it, so they're not kind of, they're not sharp and prickly ghost notes. They've got sort of a little bit of breath in them, and some of them disappear into the mix of the groove as soon as the band comes in. Additionally, I am under the impression and the belief that he was playing rim shots on the backbeats based on demonstrations and videos that he made playing it. As far as the day that they cut the track, it's anybody's guess, but when I sat down and played, it sounded correct to do the ghost notes in the center and then catch not super aggressive rim shots, but just sort of add the rim into like a medium kind of strike. And period correct, and in terms of the sound, we have a ring on here to make sure that we're not getting a lot of overtones. It's worth mentioning that this drum sounds real different without the ring, and we'd like to show you a quick A-B of it with and without. So as you can see, having the ring is good too, but this is part of the thing of not saying no to anything. If I think a ring's gonna do it and I'm not really a ring guy, it's still about the sound. So I actually tuned the drum with the ring on rather than tuning with it off and then checking with the ring to make sure I was getting in the right pitch range for the drum. Speaking of pitch, what I do when I'm trying to get in the ballpark of a sound like this is I listen to the recording and I kind of hum to myself and try to find a pitch that feels like it's the central pitch of the drum. And then I sing that in my head as I'm tuning the snare. And sometimes it's just a couple of lugs that have to move. Sometimes it's the whole head that has to move. But generally speaking, I use the batter head to find that for myself and then I use the snare side for the feel of that and hopefully they work in conjunction sometimes you have to move them both up and down or change the ratio but internally speaking I'm listening to it in headphones just kind of humming with it trying to pit and match to that pitch a little bit and then hum that to myself as I'm tuning the snare hitting in the edge hitting it in the center and then I'll record it a little bit and see if I'm getting close And now for something completely different, but still in the pocket realm, still from a few years back, James Brown's narrow sounds. I am obsessed with this stuff. I'm so fascinated by that era in the 60s, particularly, and also the 70s, where they had these incredible kind of dry punchy sounds where there were some special ways that they were approaching the way that they played them to get the drums to behave that way. And a lot of the time, modern players with modern technique struggle to figure out how to make that kind of character come out of the drums, even if they have the right drums and even the right tuning. The two tracks that we're zooming in on today are Sex Machine, everybody's heard that one at one point in their life. It's kind of a classic track, it's in tons of movies. And also one from a little bit later called The Payback, which is a similar kind of snare sound, but one kind of specific difference to it. And for this snare sound, and I, I'm under the impression that this is used a lot in this era in these recordings, we pulled out the Acrolyte, which is from the 60s. We're doing it up with a fairly standard 10 mil coated batter, standard 3 mil snare side, and standard 20 strand wires. Pretty kind of down the middle, but there's a couple of special things that we're going to do to it. We want articulation, right? We want clarity in the ghost notes. We want to hear everything that we're doing. The first thing we need to address is the snare side head. We're going for fairly tight, but not maxed out. But the big important thing here is we're going to raise the tension on the tension rods that are away from the snares, the four that are not adjacent to the wires themselves. This gives us more of a tabletop level snare side hoop, and it changes the distribution of tension on the head and also the topography of the head a little bit. So we get a little less breath in the wires and a little more just kind of immediate clarity in them without having to tune that head super duper tight. The second thing we do, tune the batter to somewhere in the range of the pitch of these recordings. Now, since it's tuned super high, it's very, very tight in these recordings, we're using kind of the high overtones at the edge rather than like a center pitch to help us get in the ballpark of what they're doing. And then door number three is, we're actually gonna use the internal muffler that's in this drum. You could also use moon gels, tape, different things, but since this was specific to these drums from this era, it's highly likely that they had these mufflers and it's highly likely that they were using them because they wanted to get rid of some of these overtones. The reason why we don't want these overtones is because this type of playing was done together, oftentimes in a room with minimal isolation, so you couldn't hit the drums super hard because they're gonna bleed into everything. When you listen to 
albums from this era, you'll notice not a lot of really laying into crash cymbals. You'll notice a lot of when you expect to hear a crash cymbal, just like a tap on a cymbal, which is surprisingly loud. This is a situation where we are relying on preamps, compression, microphones to give us a big, beautiful sound, but we're not really smashing the drums. When you have drums tuned like this and mic'd that way, these overtones are going to be super duper present when you start to compress things. And you don't want to have to do a lot of EQing because there weren't a lot of mics on the drums back then. Sometimes it was only one or two. So you have to make sure that the collective sound of the drums when you're playing them is what's going to go into that mic and you can't have any errant overtones that are going to overwhelm everything. First up, we're going to do a little bit with the muffler on and then we're going to take it off for a little bit of a comparison. Now executing this, the drum feels pretty tight. It feels pretty stiff to play on. It's very different than the previous example, which felt a little bit more pillowy, even though it was tuned reasonably high. This sometimes for people can take a little bit of getting used to if you're not accustomed to the way it feels to hit a fairly tight snare. Doubly so if you're doing what I'm doing in the muffled examples and not catching the rim, but just treating the center as the only thing we're doing to avoid getting the rim sound in there and avoid having spikes jump out that are going to kind of take us out of the collective sound of the kit. Now there are some other tracks that are definitely rim shots because um, I've seen it played. I've seen a lot of demonstrations and like Funky Drummer, some other ones where they might be hitting a little bit harder where it's a lot of ghost notes and they want that rim to bring out the backbeat. Catching it a little, but we're not rearing up and really smacking it. It's just adding that in, but we're still living inside of a pretty narrow dynamic. Let's take a quick moment to hear the difference between having the internal muffler engaged and then removing it. Now one of the fun things about these super high tuned sounds is they sit in a mix in a really specific way and they also sit in the general mix of the whole drum set in a different kind of way. We brought out the vintage Gretsch bass drum for this one with full heads. We leaned a pillow on the front to kind of chill it out. We brought out the old K hi-hats that are quieter, a little bit darker. This is all about integration of sounds. Nothing's too punchy, nothing's too brash, nothing's too loud. The snare is kind of the voice that jumps out the kick less so, and then the hi-hats blend into the background. This is all in furtherance of the idea that we're doing minimal miking and we want to have a balanced sound of everything with nothing being too present relative to everything else. Now compared to Rosanna, which has some alone drums at the beginning, when you're going after sounds like this where there's a lot of stuff on top of it, or it, rather if you're going for something that's in the character, it's worth noting what else is happening when they're hitting the snare. If you listen to Sex Machine, for instance, there's guitar on all of the snare hits. There's kind of backbeats with the pick, so that becomes part of the snare sound. Similarly, if you listen to the payback, there's a shaker or a kabasa or something on top of that, which is also on top of the snare sound. It becomes part of it. Whatever's happening on two and four is kind of getting integrated into that backbeat. So being able to sort of differentiate and understand which parts of it you're actually trying to get with the snare sound and which parts of it are coming from elsewhere, it saves us a lot of grief because sometimes we can get caught up in that having it not be exactly the same. And that's why approaching this as we are from a character perspective rather than trying to match things perfectly makes a lot of sense to me. Incidentally, we could do James Brown sounds with the previous snare drum. We don't have to have a vintage Acrolyte. You don't have to have any particular thing. There's a lot of character in every drum, and even if we know exactly what the exact setup was from that certain session, there's enough wiggle room, enough crossover between most of the drums that we have here that we could get something usable in the character. It just so happens that we have this one, and sure enough, it got there really easily. We didn't have to fuss with it much at all. With Rosanna, for instance, there wasn't a lot of fussing either because I've gone for that tuning before, but it's worth noting that the drum on that take is a 6.5 by 14 inch Radio King solid maple drum. Pretty different than a shallow cherry stave shell. But nevertheless, if you're going after the character, spend a little time, work on your ears, it is there.
that about wraps it up for today. Thanks so much for going with us on this journey. And if you've been with us for a while, you may have seen an earlier episode where we were talking about how to practice tuning. This idea of getting in the ballpark of recorded sounds is a fantastic way to practice tuning. It's also a fantastic way to just train your ear in general because again, it's all in furtherance of getting a sound that you want and we really don't want people worrying too much about matching sounds, copying sounds, making things exactly like somebody else, but more in the same way that we study playing. It's not about it being exactly like your favorite player. It's about learning what you like about what they do and then integrating that into your own thing. Tuning, sounds, it's the exact same dance. And there's a ton of them out there that work in lots of genres, lots of styles. It's worth investigating as much as we can. 